Today, mysticism is everywhere, even Christian churches. Ancient shamanism is rising. What is it? And why should you care? Welcome to Hope on Fire, talk radio for life. And now today's host, Chris Lang. In a world of growing chaos and confusion, I'm glad to know we have a rock to stand on. His name is Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. The one who came on a rescue mission to save a rebel planet. Hi, I'm Chris Lang and I'm your host today on Hope on Fire. Today I'm joined by my good friend Stephanie Griffin, who appeared in our latest film, Mystified, The Rise of Mysticism and the Antichrist. Stephanie practiced a Christianized form of mysticism called spiritual formation for nearly nine years before God brought her out. Stephanie, welcome to our program today. It's really, really great to have you. Hey, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So how is it that you and I actually got connected? We've been friends for a long time. Yes, yes. Well, it goes way back to high school, right? So we went to academy together. God ordained, orchestrated this, um, our our sophomore year. And after that, you went back to your previous place. And But we kept in touch. So a little bit over the years, you always stayed close to our class. And of course, we loved that. Uh, after I came out of what I was in for almost nine years, I was finishing my book and building a website. And so I thought about you, and I know, again, God put that on my mind. So I wanted to see if you would be okay if I put a link to your website on my website to send some, you know, send people uh, to a good solid place uh, for more information and a biblical uh, content. So we talked and that's what happened. You called me back. I was at work, I believe. And we were talking. And just as we were about to hang up, I think I remember saying, Oh, by the way, my husband met, knew Roger Morneau. <laughs> and then we didn't hang up. We talked for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> and then you ended up at my house, at our house filming. So we had. I don't know, it just evolved into this whole big thing. Again, God ordained and it was just a a great, fantastic experience. Before we continue, I just want to invite those who are listening on radio to to visit uh, hopeonfire.tv. You can see this episode, the video version. You can also visit our YouTube channel. Uh, And our channel there is My Life Streams. This is a channel of Life Streams Media. But as we're smiling here, I'm just agreeing with you that God knows the end from the beginning and uh, that we would know each other in high school. And I was only at your school for that one year and we became mm-hmm. friends. Mm-hmm. And um, and then a whole life, it seems like a whole lifetime later, um, yes, and I saw you in Southern California a couple of times, but that that pivotal call in 2017 when you had just finished your book and I knew nothing about the journey you had been on. I, I, I could never have expressed if somebody asked me, have you heard of spiritual formation? Um, that sounds like a Christian term and that's the point, right? Right. <laughs> the, the whole, that's whole the draw. point of, right. The, 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 all of the terminology, all of the words, that they taught you were part of the planning device of capturing Christians, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. It was. It's very planned. It's it's Christianese, right? They use Christianese to bring you into something you think is biblical because it sounds that way and it's the vocabulary similar to what you're used to hearing and reading in the Bible, but it's very different. I want to... Um show the movie poster here for our audience. And again, for those of you who are listening on the radio, uh, come to hopeonfire.tv and you'll be able to see this, this episode or on our YouTube channel, my live streams. Um, 
this is a poster that has Stephanie on it, and we'll be talking to Samuel uh, in a pre, uh, future episode about his uh, involvement with mysticism and God's faithfulness to pull him out uh, miraculously, just like God did for Stephanie. Why don't you give a summary of that nine, almost nine year journey that you were on, and then we'll play a, a clip and, and kind of unpack and discuss the bigger picture. I, I have a couple of clips that I think will be interesting to talk about. Okay. Well, when I, when spiritual formation found me, right, I had been through a period of rejecting God. I had been hurt due to family issues, finding out that my uh, my father, who I believed to be my father my whole life, was actually not my father, and my stepfather was actually my biological father. So um, these people who were Christians had basically lied to me my whole life. And so after that, I was very hurt. So I felt betrayed by people who call themselves Christians. So it was, um, I, I, of course, I went straight to God and told him, I don't want anything more to do with you. So stay out of my life. And we know it's a very dangerous position to be in. There are people who have done the same thing and very shortly uh, became possessed and they lost their lives, eternal lives. Mm. So I am grateful for God's hand of protection over my life. And I'm grateful that we serve a God who knows our hearts and who knows the end from the beginning. So he knew that I would eventually come back. I would choose him. And I praise God that he, he never left me, but he was constrained to work in my life because he cannot uh, go against our choice, our will. Mm -hmm. So I was very, very blessed and very protected to not have died during those years um, that I was estranged from him because I would have, mm -hmm. you know, he would have had to honor my decision or my, my, my demand, I should say. But after that, um, there was, my grandfather passed away, but before he passed away, he was in the hospital, very sick. And I was told to come home and see him if I wanted to see him again. And uh, I went to see him. And as I was standing at his bedside, he asked me to pray for him. Now, I didn't have a relationship with God at the time to be able to pray for him. And this is a man who I loved and respected. And I was very close to him growing up and as an adult. So I didn't want to do something that was not true, that was a lie. So I called my father and he came over and prayed with him. And then uh, again, another divine appointment. My grandfather passed when I was the one standing by his bedside. So from there, I just, it was a call to my heart. It was, it was a time when I decided that I wanted to be able to pray for patients. I was an emergency room nurse and people die. And so in that, in that area of nursing, you can be their last person they see. And I wanted to be able to give my patients what my grandfather had wanted from me. I wanted to be able to pray with them if they needed that. And I knew that I needed to have a relationship with Christ myself. So mm -hmm. I started reading my Bible and then my relationship with Guru. And it was after a three day fast and prayer um, session that God actually ended up moving me to Southern California. So I was moonlighting at a, a, a local hospital and met a, a very grandfatherly chaplain. So this was a grandfather wound that Satan knew about and provided just the right person to meet that wound, the healing of that wound, so to speak. He invited me into uh, a relationship to meet with him once a month to see what God was doing in my life as a spiritual friend. Now, I knew nothing about spiritual direction. I knew nothing about spiritual formation, none of this. So I didn't really understand, but I wasn't interested. But it was about, I don't know, a few years later, he 
he would continue to bring it up and, and offer that occasionally. And I was like, no. Then one day after I'd been away for a bit, um, I came back to that hospital and ran into him. And once again, it was kind of a woman at the well experience. He told me everything that was going on in my life. Now there's one person who knows what's going on and that's God. There's also yeah. another person, right? Mm -hmm. So Satan knows everything that's going on in our lives. And he told me everything that's that had been going on. And I thought, wow, this is a man who is so connected to God that he knows what's happening in my life. God speaks to him. That's the kind of relationship I wanted. I wanted to go deeper. And and you were so it, and you were in a vulnerable place mm -hmm. because you were going through a breakup, weren't you? Yes, through a very difficult breakup. And I was in nursing. I mean, I was in the emergency room for years and I was so burned out. I would cry my way to work and I would come home and unplug the phone. That's when we had home phones, right? And I just didn't want to speak with anybody. Then I would cry my way to work the next day. I was a living zombie. So when you bring all this together, um, I was reunited with my family. There had been a lot of healing from before. But there was also an intense desire to go deeper with God. And then prayer was especially important to me. I, if there was something more about prayer to learn, I wanted to know it. And it was in our first spiritual direction session that he introduced me to Thomas Keating's books uh, on how to, uh, how to pray, which was on contemplative prayer. So I read those books devoured them and then began my journey into contemplative prayer and then into the other practices. The chaplain, as you shared with me, was a Quaker, correct? Oh, no, he was a Nazarene. He had been a, a Nazarene. Nazarene. He was a reverend uh, okay. in, in the Nazarene church and then had stepped away from that and was all was 100% uh, working full-time as a hospital chaplain. Okay. But he was describing something about holding you in the light. Yes, I know what you're talking about. Okay, so this is how when he saw me again after a period of time when we hadn't seen one another, I don't know if the viewers can see this, um, yeah. he said, when I pray for you, and I didn't understand what this was at the time, he said, this is what I, this is what I sense. I sense, you know, hurt. Um, stress, uh, I mean, all these things, and it has something to do with a man. Well, this actually is a Quaker way of praying. And this is something that is introduced, I mean, right along with contemplative prayer. It's It goes hand in hand. But you are basically holding that person up to the light of Christ. There's a candle in the room, and then you hold that, hold your hands up to the candle and that represents you're holding that person up to the light of Jesus. And then basically it's like a portal. That's what opens up things and um, it begins another journey. <laughs> so that, uh, that's how he knew, right? <laughs> we did a little research uh, about that. And it's, it's interesting when you study the history of the Quaker tradition, I believe it's Fox, the founder of the of the Quaker uh, journey. Um, the emphasis is on experience, spiritual experience, more than "Thus saith the Lord." Right? It's a, it's more of an experiential yeah. religion than it is about studying and learning an objective truth. I don't even know that they read the Bible. They will sit in a room like with chairs around in a square or sometimes a circle and they will just sit there not say anything just contemplate quietly and then that's the end of their service they walk out so it's not it's not a biblically based religion at all you were given another book by an author named richard foster correct i found that book okay. i was going to i was going to azusa um, Pacific University at the time on my master's in nursing, and I found that book. Richard Foster, for those who don't know who he is, famous for the book Celebration of Discipline, and he wrote a book on prayer, which was a book that Stephanie read 
where he actually warns people about the dangers, right? Yes, he does. He says, before you, before you pray, remember there's a, and I'm paraphrasing, there's another dimension out there. There's another spirit world out there. I don't know if you use a spirit, but there's another world out there. And he's like, you need to practice prayers of protection so that you don't open yourself up to that realm. But I never, I don't remember reading that at all, or I would never have done it, right? So yeah. somehow or another, I was blinded to that part of it. And, and there were, and, and the terms uh, that you were, were taught with Thomas Keating and Richard Foster also, they, they, were, they were all influenced by the mystics, the Catholic mystics of the oh, Middle yeah. Ages, right? You know, yes, Teresa Desert Vavilla. Fathers and Mothers, yes. The contemplative prayer or contemplative prayer for those who are not like in the center of, of the practice, um, why don't you explain what kind of prayer it is and how it's different from what we understand biblical prayer is? Okay. Well, I'll start with the, with the truth. And that is, you know, David says um, he meditates, right? He meditates on the law. And so he doesn't empty his mind. He fills his mind with the word of God. This is the Bible is our springboard for prayer. We have a very active, engaged mind. God gave us the ability to reason, to think, to discern. And so we are to use all of those pieces, um, you know, along with the Holy Spirit who uh, accompanies us when we read the Bible and invite him into our prayer time. Now, when you look at contemplative or contemplative prayer, really, <laughs> I, I kind of relearned how I said that, but I always said contemplative prayer when I was in it, because that's how the initiates pronounce it. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, that's true. <laughs> it is true. Yes. So what happens is the first thing they will tell you is you need to empty your mind because those thoughts get in the way of hearing God. And now Dallas Willard, paraphrasing again, says that uh, contemplative prayer is the most intimate part um, and it's sanctification. So I would feel, I felt bad for those of you who did not practice contemplative prayer because you could not uh, have as an intimate of a relationship with Christ as I thought I could. So there is an element of pride about it too um, when you are a mystic. But anyway, so from there, uh, you empty your mind and they always say you need a prayer word, right? So for me, I chose Jesus because I felt it was safe. And it's interesting that I felt I needed something safe. That's That should have been a red flag. But I chose Jesus and I would just picture myself. They love to use the imagination and that's another tool. God gave us an imagination, but they use it in a different way. It's a Jesuit tool and tactic to get you away from the Word of God. I would imagine myself like in the forest sitting on a log, um, and I would just say, Jesus, I'd close my eyes. And very quickly, you learn to go into the, the silence without even saying a word. And just like, okay, I'm, I'm going to contemplate now, and then boom, you're there. So it's just really just a little tool that they use to get you there when you don't know what to do. But that's it. One, the, the biblical prayer fills your mind with the Word of God, and contemplative prayer empties your mind. And when we, when we empty our minds, studies, CT, okay, they did a study on Zen Buddhist, MRI scans, not CT, the, the MRI scans of the brain. During the, the during their meditation time, which Zen Buddhists meditate, right? Their frontal lobes were offline. They had decreased blood flow, which means they had decreased oxygenation in that front frontal lobe, and it was offline in terms of today with computers. It's like kind of what happens. So then they did a study of nuns who were actually saying the Lord's Prayer, and that frontal lobe was lit up. So we have an engaged brain when we do biblical prayer, and then we have a disengaged when we do contemplative prayer. Now the Holy Spirit speaks to us in that frontal lobe. That's where we become convicted, right? And we discern. When that is offline, you do not, the Holy Spirit can't speak to you, but another spirit can, as Alice A. Bailey says. 
spirits from past, present, and future can drop thoughts in your mind. So that level of protection that the Holy Spirit gives you in biblical prayer uh, is gone. And then you're open to another spirit or spirits. And some people will get spirit guides right away. I did not because, well, I don't know how far you want me to go, but my belief and understanding in the biblical teaching of the state of the dead, which is when you when you die, you die. You're sleeping, waiting for Jesus to come and take you home, resurrect you and take you home. So if I had had a spirit guide manifest to me, I would have known right away that was yeah. an evil spirit. So yeah. Satan, again, only went so far with me with certain things to keep me entrenched. So... No, I think that that's a wonderful synopsis of what it was. And and also, um, you actually shared with me that it was an addictive experience as well. And we mentioned that in the film, in Mystified. This, again, is the, the movie poster for those of you who are watching the program. Uh, you can see the, the you can see more information about the film at mystifiedfilm.com. And as I say, you can watch it for free on our YouTube channel, My Life Streams. The, the film Mystified actually gives the history of mysticism. And Stephanie's story is presented as a on-the-ground human, uh, real-life human story that was uh, vulnerable and uh, was sucked right into because of the desire you had, Steph. You had a legitimate mm -hmm. desire to learn how to pray and how to connect with the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. And I would say that that's the case for most Christians who become involved in this. They really do want to experience more of God, but that's just it. It's an experience that's not rooted in the Bible or in the Holy Spirit, but it is very much an experience. How was it that you, that you saw God moving and helping you see the difference and the true biblical power of prayer versus the non-conceptual kind of prayer? Mm -hmm. Okay, good question. When I was in, I, I began a, a journey to become a spiritual director myself. So I'd finished two years, two and a half years of a three-year program. And it was in the, the two and a half year period in that half, that last half, that the cracks started to break. They started to fall apart. And that is, uh, I saw and heard a couple of my um, my instructors use the Lord's name in vain. They never apologized. They never flinched. I was horrified. I also read the Ragamuffin Gospel. And that's a huge spiritual formation um, book. And, and then there, he uses the Lord's name in vain. So things were starting to not add up. And then in my own readings for my, my curriculum for this, they just started to start to feel like they didn't make sense. They were no longer resonating as, as beautiful as I thought they were uh, and mesmerizing because they are very much mesmerizing. But I can see how God was breaking that spirit from me. And... Um, it no longer had a draw. And not only that, but I wasn't understanding it. So I had actually, there had been a lot going on. My dad got sick, really sick, and was in a nursing home for a year. And so I just stopped the program. I thought, you know, there's too much going on. It's stress and I'm not resonating with this. I need to take a break. I'll get back to this next year and I'll finish it up. Well, God had other plans and I had a job change and um, my job required me to get um, another degree. So I started working on that degree. And from there, uh, I, I got married uh, to Don D, for those of you who know him from um, Charmed by Darkness, who knew Roger. And when he started seeing some of the things that I was involved with, he just was like, he didn't get it. And he started praying for me. And then so my sister also around that time came for a visit, went to the uh, to the bookstore when we had bookstores, the Christian bookstores, and she prayed before she went in there, a biblical prayer. And she said, Lord, if there's anything in here that somebody needs, lead me to it. And um, thank you. 
you know, for answering my prayer. She went in and she saw this book and she just was drawn to this book. She went to pick it up. She read the back of it, didn't understand it, put it back. This happened three times. And after that, she's like, I'm just supposed to buy this book. So she did. The book's name, for those of you who want to know, is uh, The Omega Rebellion by Rick Howard. This was a gentleman who had been in the New Age and had come out and was a, a, a pastor. And he was blowing the lid off spiritual formation in the church, uh, connecting it to the New Age. And so after I read that book that very night, I read that book when she got home. Uh, I mean, I was just so drawn to it. And I thought, okay, yeah, I won't practice spiritual formation anymore, but he's from the new age and he, he meditated. I'm doing biblical prayer. So I, I'm good, but God had more plans and it was not long thereafter that I found Howard Peth's book, uh, the dangers of contemplative prayer. That book was so hard to read. I mean, it was good, but it was hard for me to read because it really hit home and convicted me. And mind you, that's the first time really I felt conviction in almost nine years. So uh, that's when I set contemplative prayer aside. But like you said, Chris, it's addicting and it was a struggle, sometimes minute by minute, but definitely a daily struggle. And I went through a real dry season um, for a few months wondering had i walked away from god and i'm not he, my prayers aren't going past the ceiling right but i continued biblical prayer i never dropped off biblical prayer praise the lord and so i was praying and then it was like it was my time of testing and god was saying to me are you serious about this are you going to trust me uh, if you don't hear from me and ironically in spiritual formation there's something called dark night of the soul and that's for people who have been in contemplative prayer for ever how long maybe a short time or, or many years and all of a sudden they no longer hear from god they don't feel like they've heard from god right so the test is will you still continue to show up will you still continue the practice and have faith that that he's still there god is still there i never experienced that in spiritual formation it was when i came out and gave up contemplative prayer that I experienced what I perceive as dark night of the soul. And I was scared if God can't, if, I mean, if Satan can't keep us bound in deception, then he will use fear. Right. But I went against my feelings. It did not feel good to not practice contemplative prayer. Um, but God blessed. And after a few months, God just moved in mighty powerful ways with the prayer life. So, he tested me and then he blessed me. And I praise God for that. There's so much more to come in our overtime segment. These materials have spirits attached to them. Meditation, contemplative prayer is about deprogramming your mind. The universe will start to talk to you. It's already talking to you. The broadcast is already going on. That we live, move and have our being in this dynamic presence of love and beauty and intelligence. I mean, the guy sounds like a preacher. He's quoting scripture. To watch the full episode, visit hopeonfire.tv and look for episode 50 titled Christian Shamans. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, My Live Streams, and don't forget to click on that bell to get notified of new episodes or films. Thanks for joining us. Hope on Fire is produced by Live Streams Media, a nonprofit film production ministry. To access this program or to make a donation, please visit hopeonfire.tv. See you next time, and may God set your hope on fire. We're going to talk a little bit about shamanism today in this extended uh, overtime segment that we've arrived at. And uh, I want to thank uh, Stephanie for joining me today on Hope on Fire Overtime. Um, thank you, Stephanie, for spending your very precious time with us today. Oh, it's a joy, Chris. Thank you. Oh, this is part of the opening sequence so that the viewers can get a, a high-level view of what the film is about. Mystics claim that all wisdom comes from inside you, that you're already God, a so-called spark of divinity, an immortal soul. 
that altered states of consciousness reveal true reality. That everything is one, and all religions lead to the same place. God is manifesting himself in all the religions in some way and in different ways. Yes. And so we can transcend the intensity of the different interpretations by the experience of the oneness that comes through contemplative prayer. Today, many universities offer courses in the Christianized form of mysticism called spiritual formation. Businesses and schools sponsor mindfulness meditation. Several U.S. states and Australia recently legalized various types of psychedelic drugs while the U.S. government is funding its research. Science and religion are merging, reviving the ancient pagan belief system called shamanism. The ayahuasca is usually described as a grandmother spirit, and I met her. You know, our ancestors are out there. Right. And if you're open, we could use that. Christ is not an individual. Christ is a collective. Is man really immortal? Was Jesus just a man? If everyone experiences their own inner truth, then who makes the rules? There's nothing to believe. You just go and you know it to be true for yourself. Where did mysticism come from? And where is it taking us? Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Yeah, so this is a combination, right, of Catholic monks, and you see a shot of the Vatican there, and some people are saying, well, what does it have to do with shamanism? What does it have to do with the famous NFL quarterback that went and did ayahuasca and got an altered state of consciousness? Well, actually, it's all actually very connected. And this is really, this is the reason why our film Mystified is three hours long, Stephanie, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yes. But now I wanna show a short clip of Stephanie from the film that will kind of give some illustration of the contemplative prayer and the labyrinth, at which we'll talk about briefly here in a second. It's really encouraged to just have one word, whether it be Jesus or God or whatever it is to that person. And it's just repeated until your mind goes blank. It's a form of self-hypnosis. And so from Thomas Keating, I learned how to go into the silence. I want to insert this as a praise report. You know, when we went to Southern California to film for Charmed by Darkness and uh, mystified. Dondi and Stephanie's stories include a lot of reenactments, actually 15 reenactments for both of their stories. And we were only there for a few days on a long weekend. Uh, when we were on a tight schedule, uh, we wanted to capture the labyrinth scene at, a, at the golden hour, which filmmakers understand is the last hour before sunset. And so when we got there, it was actually raining. Uh, you know the famous saying, it never rains in Southern California. Well, it was actually raining there. And the only place on my uh, weather app was right over the university. Stephanie and Dondi and Mark Payton and myself. Mark Payton was the... Uh, my partner, uh, camera operator. He's a great young filmmaker. You should check out his work. So the four of us were sitting in the vehicle while it was raining on uh, the labyrinth and we, we didn't, there's no way we could pull out our equipment out of the vehicle. The drone that Mark had brought, um, 
everything was just sitting there and and so I offered to send up a prayer and so we together prayed that God would stop the rain so that we could capture this scene for for the film and uh, within less than 30 seconds after saying in Jesus name amen the rain stopped and the clouds moved away and the evidence is there on the sidewalk and the street in the distance you can see the reflection that they're still wet that in, in fact the evidence is there that it had been raining and uh, the Lord worked in that situation so that we could get our gear out and capture that scene so I hope that encourages you. And now we're gonna go back to my interview with Stephanie. Stephanie represents the Christianized form of mysticism. Her story helps to illustrate how, what does this look like on the ground? Because when we talk about Vatican II in the film, you know, we unpack it so that the viewer who knows nothing about it can understand that it was part of the 1960s. It was part of this huge push of mysticism on the world, right? Uh, that included psychedelic drugs. It included the Beatles. It included Elvis. And we have a whole section on Elvis Presley and his spiritual journey and how, as a Christian, he could actually end up um, studying hundreds of books that actually teach that you're God that you're divine, and that Jesus was just a man who taught us how to tap into our own inner divinity. And so it wasn't, you know, what's shocking about mystified stuff, and, and maybe you can share before we get into these, these next clips, uh, which actually um, nobody has seen before. We haven't shared the stuff I'm about to share but that's definitely connected to our conversation today. Um, the, the shock that I'm seeing in the comments of people who see mystified stuff is quite something. Um, they feel stressed when they watch these Roman Catholics who, who claim to be Christian saying Jesus was not God and Christ is not a person. What was what was your feeling? What happened in your spirit when you heard these famous people saying this about Jesus? You know, that's so interesting, Chris, because even just listening to this playback right here on the on this um, segment, my heart was hurting. It's just it becomes more real every time I see it and hear it. And it's just it's baffling to me how people who who claim to be Christians and spiritual leaders in our churches uh, are saying these things. How did they get to this point? Mm -hmm. How can they do this? You know, this didn't happen overnight. It happens little by little by little. It's progressive. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sorry, but when you're looking at the papacy, this is all a planned agenda. There's, we have beautiful, wonderful, loving Catholics. Uh, who have no clue what the papacy is doing um, and who are will be saved, right? So they, they don't know and they're sincere in their faith. But then there is this whole governing body the, of the, who know what they're doing. And where was I going with this? <laughs> Uh, I mean, they just, they have an agenda. So, oh, oh, when you look at the roots of the Catholic Church, the papacy in particular, you, you, go, you move into the occult. It's the, the occult is revealed. So to hear them say these things, knowing the roots of it, it makes perfect sense. They're speaking yeah. the same language as the occult. Yeah, I, I think that for the first time, in, in my journey, in my research the last three years of putting this together, Steph, I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, as we, as we show in the last part of the film, the prophecy of the Bible describes a power in the world that exists for over a thousand years, for over 1,500 years. 
um, that, that arose after the fall of pagan Rome and had all kinds of descriptors that can only fit one system in history. And I'm glad that you brought up the fact that there are very sincere Catholic uh, believers who believe in Jesus, who pray to Jesus, mm -hmm. who believe in the God of the Bible, um, and, they're, and they're living up to the light that they, that they have today to the best of their ability. And God mm -hmm. sees them. The Bible tells us, and we show the scriptures in our film. We show the scriptures from Romans 2 and from John chapter 9. Jesus said, if, the, if you're blind, you're not going to be held accountable. But if you claim to see, like he told the Pharisees of the day, you're still blind and you're, going to be, you're still going to be guilty because you claim that you can see. And so, um, yes, I have, I have Catholic friends like you do, Steph, and, and we, we're talking about a system in this right. film. We're not talking system about and, individuals. Right, system and teachings, right, doctrines. Right. They, they don't like doctrine, but doctrine just means teaching, and their teaching is not consistent with the Bible. I want to add this too, because as you were talking, it also, it hit me. You know, as steeped as I was in spiritual formation, prior to that, I had read Roger Monod's books on prayer. So I appreciated uh, prayer. Um, I knew about the sanctuary message. I, I was very grounded and rooted in, in my belief system uh, more than even I had been before I left it, right? I, I found a lot of truths that I didn't understand growing up when I came back to this message. And this is the same, the same path that many Christians unfortunately go down to. These things, these truths are protectant when we listen to them, when we believe them. But when we start engaging in reading other materials, we compromise. These materials have spirits attached to them. And so it kind of takes over our mind and then we forget where we've, you know, the truths and because things feel so good and sound so good and it's just, just Jesus, you know, you take away everything else and it's just, just relationship. But uh, it's not why I started this, but I'm saying that anybody can fall for this. So we don't need to judge anybody for doing that. We just need to pray for them, love them and bring truth forward when opportunity pro, um, provides itself prayerfully yeah. but i was sitting in an emerging church this is why I, I brought this up i was sitting in an emerging church and not until i finished the book and started researching for presentations that i even understood anything about the emerging church i didn't know what one was until someone challenged me they're connected i'm like huh well what is the emerging church I started digging deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's when God showed me the connection between spiritual formation and the emerging church. Spiritual formation is the, for the fundamentalist, the person who believes in the Bible, sola scriptura. These are the tools that help to undermine your faith. It's an undoing of your faith. So then you can just begin rewriting the Bible according to culture, right. the social gospel, etc., cetera, um, and to just embrace everybody because we have to be love, right? Jesus is love and he is, but he, he's also truth. Right. But so I was, when I learned this, I realized I had been sitting in an emerging church when I was involved in this stuff, didn't even know when one was, but, but the realization came when, okay, we, we connected the Vatican to the papacy, to the occult, but it's no different in the emerging church because that's built on new age. It's progressive uh, teachings and it's, it leads you to the new age, which is, ends up in the occult. So it's just the Christianized version of the occult. Yeah, I agree. The, um, there, there, are, there are connected stair steps away from this what has become cast as an evil term and you mentioned it a few minutes ago fundamentalist um, i want to show a clip um, here in a minute of michael beckwith who 
you actually alerted me to a couple of years ago. And I was thinking of putting clips of Michael Beckwith in our film Mystified, but I felt convicted uh, after praying about it that we should only leave the major uh, leading Catholic voices after Vatican II. Again, for those who don't know, Vatican II was a convocation that lasted three years by the Vatican. There were over 2,000 cardinals who came from around the world for this uh, series of meetings over the course of three years, 1962 to 1965. And it was um, essentially a launching pad for taking the monastic traditions, and it's, it's written right in their documents, in their council documents, that the contemplative traditions were to be promoted in all the world and implemented as an evangelistic uh, strategy by, by the Vatican. And, and the mystics that undergird the monastic and the, you know, the convents of the nuns and the monasteries of the, of the, of the monks are the, are the bedrock of mysticism. The, the practices of altered states of consciousness and walking labyrinths and uh, Lectio Divina and all of these things that we mention in the film, they have their, have their founding bedrock in the monastic orders. And that those are the people that you see in our film. Thomas Keating, um, Wayne Teasdale, Richard Rohr, Paul Nitter, all of these famous voices that were all trained by Jesuits, most of them Jesuit trained by other famous Jesuits. Carl Rahner, we talk about in the film, who was an engineer of the Vatican II conv convocation. So why am I name dropping? I'm name dropping because those were the foundational pieces of this fountainhead of promotion that has become what it is today. Um, now, we mentioned Richard Foster is a great example, a very famous, uh, what I'm calling a middleman. Because when you read Richard Foster, eventually you find out who he was inspired by. He was inspired by the medieval mystics of the Middle Ages, of Catholic mystics. And so he's a middleman between Protestantism and the Vatican. And so I left those voices out of the film. And this is an opportunity now for us to help educate uh, the, the viewers and the listeners um, to, and, and then to show the contrast like you're doing, like we're doing together today, Steph, is to show what the Bible says about prayer to show what the Bible says. And this is going to actually be a series of programs because we can't unpack it all in one or two episodes. It's going to take some time. And that's, again, why Mystified is three hours long. But Michael, Beck, Michael Beckwith represents a modern shaman, but he is wearing a suit every Sunday. He goes to what looks like a church. It's, a, it's an audience, and everybody's dressed up in their Sunday best. And he's preaching, but his sermon is about how you're divine and how you're an emanation of God, literally the essence of God. And you're an immortal soul that never dies and never had a beginning and never has an end. And uh, why am I bringing all this up? It's because the Roman Catholic system, the Vatican system, wants you to believe that it doesn't matter what you believe. I mean, that's actually what they say. What, what they want you to do is to be deprogrammed. Because, and you even hear the statement by the Roman Catholic monk Richard Rohr in our film. He says, meditation, contemplative prayer is about deprogramming your mind. In fact, he uses the word unlearning, mm -hmm. right, Steph? Yes, very familiar word in spiritual formation. We have to unlearn so that we can relearn who Jesus really is. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, wanna, I want to uh, uh, real quick go back to this so that you can see. So 
this is this is a book that Elvis Presley was famous. Uh, he he was his hairdresser Larry Geller, who we we present a clip of Larry Geller in the film Mystified, as a witness that uh, gave this book to Elvis back in the '60s, and it, and it was such a special book, a little book called The Impersonal Life. And the whole concept of this book is that it, it was written by a Lutheran pastor who who, chant, who who actually believed he received this message from God and it was channeled from a spirit that he that claimed to, to be God. And this became Elvis's favorite book, according to Larry Geller and several other sources who wrote biographies of, of Elvis Presley. Uh, on the right, the, the red cover with Elvis's picture on it was actually published by his estate, Graceland. Um, and they're actually admitting that it was his favorite little book. And he gave them away by the hundreds, by the way. And this one statement, it says, I as the Christ dwell in all men and in their one and only self. We could not possibly be separated for I am you. And this is the crux, really, of what the uh, Roman Catholic priests are, 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 are saying. But you have to listen, right, Steph? You have to read or, or watch a lot of videos to actually mm -hmm. get clips where they're actually saying the same thing. And that's why it took so long to put Mystified together, because the clips are actually parallel to this. And, 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 and this idea that God and you are not separate. And we're going to show a statement by Thomas Keating that says the same thing. Uh, but first, let's show this short uh, couple minutes of Michael Beckwith, and you'll understand that he's saying the same thing. And he's a modern Christianized sort of, not Christian, but he quotes scripture. And that's why... This is the beginning of a final deception, I believe, because he, he's quoting scripture, but listen to what he says. So the practice of meditation, the practice of the art of real prayer, takes you beyond believing, so you have your own direct realization, and you don't have to believe anyone about anything. Go ahead and just tap, tap the third eye right between the eyebrow, just tap it. You slowly are letting go of a personal sense of a separation uh, from the presence of God, love, beauty, joy, whatever name you want to use to call this universal presence that's everywhere. The personal sense of separation begins to dissolve. A mystic is not a strange and mysterious person. A mystic is one who consciously knows that they're one with the presence of God. You become a, a field, not just a belief system. We don't want any more believers, please. <laughs> you can become a fundamentalist if you become a believer. Mm. And though the presence is infinite, and though the presence is invisible, it is not. He looks it like is a pastor, doesn't he? Invisible, undivided from me. Mm -hmm. I'm one with this presence. My life is the life of God Almighty. God, all beauty, God, all joy. Surrender your life to the presence. The universe will start to talk to you. It's already talking to you. The broadcast is already going on. It just needs your permission to yeah. come in. I could see that we were surrounded, that, that this presence wasn't in everything, but that everything was in this presence that we live, move, and have our being in this dynamic presence of love and beauty and intelligence. For because so very often you bite the bait of seeing yourself as something wretched, something that has some kind of original sin, something they used to teach back in the old days that we don't want to bring into the new days. We, we don't harbor with such a superstitious nastiness. I can remember when I was in Africa with a, working with a particular shaman and he took me out into the jungle and I, we were talking and communing with the trees and after I left the jungle pitch black, everything was aglow, it was like daylight. I mean, when we talk about Moses seeing the burning bush, Moses was just having a good day because the bush is always burning. <laughs> okay, just inserting this comment, uh, the things that you've heard him talking about here, no separation, 
You don't uh, have to believe anything that anyone tells you when you meditate. You learn true reality, and that's true prayer, supposedly. He also makes fun of the biblical teaching of the fallen nature of mankind. Uh, Jeremiah 17, verse 9, and says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. In other words, we can't even know how wicked naturally our hearts are unless God himself reveals to us our great need for someone outside of us to save us. And that's what Jesus Christ did for the whole world. You hear him talk about Moses and the burning bush, which comes from Exodus 3. But then he's overlaying his comments uh, from a, an animistic or shamanistic viewpoint that everything has a soul and everything can be communicated with, whether it's a rock or a plant or, or a tree or a planet. Um, everything is divine, including you. And that is the essence of uh, shamanism and animism, which uh, he's sort of Christianized by quoting from the Bible. There's something about us that's forever. And that part of us that's forever is spiritual, which means it never, it never began and it will never end. And this is why we sometimes pray in substance, the saying, show me the glory I had before the beginning of time. Let me see the glory I had with thee before the beginning of time. And that the presence of God is looking at you, looking at itself. Hmm. Um, but did you notice the scripture he was paraphrasing? Part, uh, he said, uh, show me my glory that I had at the beginning with you at the beginning of time. Do you remember where that comes from? He's quoting Jesus from John 17. Hmm. Jesus famous prayer for his people, not just his disciples, but he was praying for those who would believe someday. And so he's literally claiming that because you are already God, he's using Jesus' words as his own words, because mm -hmm. God and him are not divisible. God and him, mm -hmm. because he is an emanate, he's teaching you that you're an emanation of God Almighty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the you essence. are I am. Right. You are the I mm -hmm. am. I, I wanted people to understand and to see how talented this guy is. And notice how he said he was with a shaman in Africa. And so here he is quoting scripture in a church on Sundays in L.A. By the way, a lot of famous celebrities go to this place. Michael Beckwith counseled with Meghan Markle and mm -hmm. former mm -hmm. Prince Harry. Uh, this is how, I believe, Steph, I believe this is how you learned about Michael Beckwith, was uh, that he had done what is called ancestral healing with them. Uh -huh. Yes. And this is shamanism. The, the shaman goes into an altered state in order to commune with the dead, previous generations of dead people who are in the lineage and uh, the whole purpose is to interact and try and heal the wounds of the living mm -hmm. and the dead. Supposedly, they're alive somewhere. Mm -hmm. Also, he's been involved with uh, ayahuasca retreats in uh, Costa Rica. He was, he was also interviewed for the movie The Secret back in 2006. Mm -hmm. uh, he appeared in that. And so he's, he's very well known. And highly, highly, you know, and Steph, some, some of the video clips that I watched of him, you can tell that he's filled with another spirit. His yes. eyes are glazed over. And at the very beginning of this clip, I intentionally, I wanted to show, he calls meditation the true prayer. Mm -hmm. And then he says, you don't have to believe anything that anyone tells you about anything. And then he says, we don't want any more believers because if you become a believer, you might become a... Fundamentalist. Fundamentalist. Oh, horrors. And this, and, th and this, of course, is something we actually explain and build up and express historically in Mystified so that people can understand this word 
is actually a dividing point today, isn't it, Stowe? It is. And it, would you be okay if I take a minute to kind of unpack the bridge? I know you mentioned Foster, but sure. um, okay, I think it might help make uh, help people understand a little bit more about how churches got to this point, and some of these leaders are saying what they're saying, who maybe are not Catholic, but are saying the same things. These people were business leaders. And so this is a business model that acts as a brokerage to the churches. And that was to create uh, seeker-friendly churches, right? Before then, they were more a little bit more traditional in nature. But now, since Leadership Network uh, has brokered with the churches, it's based on research. Churches are created based on research. So now we have non-denominationals. People don't want to be divided. They just want to come together, right? Throw away things we don't agree on, just Jesus. Uh, they want an experience. So we have this emotion-driven music, uh, repetitive, that sort of thing. They feel something. Darkened worship environments, again, an experience. Um, coffee. Research showed that they want to just kind of come together, socialize, have coffee. That's huge. And and good music and, and a little mini sermonette. And, and just walk away feeling good. That feeling was an experience. Uh, they must have experienced God because they felt something. So, but all of that to say, the word is thrown aside, right, for research. I mean, for for things that people want in the church, which none of that was the word of God and truth in the research. But these leaders, uh, in the leadership network and such, they have they have people from the occult who come and give them seminars and then these people these leaders who had these occultists give them seminars then come and teach the churches how to grow your church so this is the influence that we're seeing so no we're not surprised that we're hearing the things that we're hearing because of the influence you have an overt influence and then you have a, you know, I guess the, uh, the esoteric influence that doesn't get talked about and you don't see, but you see the results of it. Right. No, that's when, very when good. You know what you're looking at. That's very good stuff. I also see, you know, we, we, we had the erosion of Protestantism over the last several decades and since Vatican II in the 1960s, it's been a steady decline. And, mm -hmm. and then the growth of the occult in the West has, it's almost been like this, like, you know, oh. a, if I can get the, you know, Protestantism mm -hmm. declining while occultism, witchcraft, Rises. shamanism, um, and, and you can see it in the media. There, there, the, the mm -hmm. numbers of feature films that were produced in the 90s and the double O's of witches and witchcraft um, was was exponentially higher compared to previous decades. And of mm -hmm. course, that's just grown since then. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you're, we have the dynamic of people reading their Bibles less and less and less and less. And then mm -hmm. we have the influence of media, this, you know, finding your truth through dynamic speakers like Michael mm -hmm. Beckwith. I mean, the guy sounds like a preacher. He's quoting mm -hmm. scripture, but he's taking it out of context and applying yes. it to an occultist idea of the nature of man. He's, mm -hmm. he's taking Jesus' own statements and he's applying them to a, a, a new age view of the nature of man. Mm -hmm. which, which is nothing different than shamanistic. The ancient shamanism is rising in this, and, and it is reincarnation. It's the immortality of the soul. It's multiple thousands of lifetimes that you've, you've had incarnation. And you'll hear Michael Beckwith. I left those clips out, by the way. But he, but he literally talks about incarnations in this human body. In this particular incarnation, you're, you're supposed to listen to the universe and you're supposed to live your life in a specific way and the universe speaks to you and tells you how to do it. So 
That's the incongruity and the hypocrisy in all of this, right? Is that it's an impersonal life that Elvis believed in because mm -hmm. you are God already. God is simply living out his life in a human being, a soul that never died. And so, but, the, but the hypocrisy in all of this is you hear them say, surrender, surrender. Mm -hmm. You hear celebrities in our film Mystified. We have clips of them saying, you have to surrender to the experience. There is a spirit involved in this transaction. Yes. Just like the Christian is called in the Bible to, to surrender to the Lord, right? And mm -hmm. then receive the Holy Spirit once you accept Jesus into your life. There's another spirit, and they're being called to surrender to yeah. it. Yeah, there's always a counterfeit, but either with either one, it's it's the will. So God created humans to be able to choose to have free will, and so who we surrender to matters. Right. But so we do have I to wanna... surrender, one way or one... the other. Amen. One spirit or another. Mm -hmm. Now. This is what we were getting to in this particular program with Stephanie, and that is what we heard Michael Beckwith talking about in that three-minute clip was that there is no separation, you know, between you and this presence. He keeps calling it the presence. And Thomas Keating, probably the most famous Catholic monk in post-Vatican II era in the late 20th century, he wrote this, God and our true self are not separate. Though we are not God, God and our true self are the same thing. This is from his book, Open Mind, Open Heart. So this is fascinating. And for those who don't know, the true self is a code word. The true self is your immortal soul that doesn't die, and it resides in your subconscious. That's why you're supposed to practice contemplative prayer, so you can go into an altered state, and this true self is, is this immortal soul that never dies, and, and God wants to speak directly to that immortal soul. Your true self is who you really are. The false self is, is a code word for your ego, which is in Buddhism, right? It's your conscious mind, your, your thoughts. That's why contemplative prayer is not prayer at all. It's called non-conceptual. They actually admit it, that it's non-conceptual prayer, which, again, is an oxymoron. <laughs> mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. so, so he's... The code word true self here is literally saying God and our immortal soul are not separate. God and our true self, that th th those are one and the same if you listen to them long enough. Um, but again, no separation. So we have the new age. We have people like Michael Beckwith who are just Christianizing this same concept. Um, and it's the original lie, which goes all the way back, stuff right, to the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Yes. You will not surely die. It's two parts in Genesis chapter three, verses four and five, the serpent, this medium, the first medium in earth's history was a serpent. And through it, Lucifer, Satan was talking. And first, this serpent says to Eve, you will not surely die. And the second part of the lie was for God knows that when you eat the fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be as God, knowing good and evil. So mm -hmm. this whole idea of non-duality that we unpack in the film, which is a term many Westerners aren't familiar with, particularly if they're Christians. But these, these Catholic monks actually speak non-dual terminology and we use those clips in the film so that people can see they're teaching the same concepts as Buddhists and Hindus. Um, yeah. And this all comes back to mysticism, this idea that good and evil coexist eternally. It's the yin and yang, right, in the circle. Um, mm -hmm. The circle represents immortality, and in the middle you have light and dark coexisting. And in spiritual this formation, is, we were... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. We were taught that uh, 
we wouldn't we wouldn't know light uh, without the presence of darkness. We wouldn't know truth without error, et cetera, et cetera. So they have to coexist, or you you wouldn't know joy if you didn't know sorrow. So it's very sneaky how they do this. But Jesuits, that Jesuit training and teaching, they don't want you thinking in duality, um, like you say, non-dual, because then there's no right or wrong. Right. Yeah. So this, um, this, the last slide uh, that I wanted to share in this uh, episode today, which, which is connected to Thomas Keating. We just showed Thomas Keating and, and uh, Stephanie mentioned that uh, this was the first book she read in her journey uh, going into spiritual formation uh, at the beginning of her nine-year journey. Um, but Thomas Keating actually started a group an annual meeting uh, of, of sort of an interfaith group that included um, Muslims, uh, Sufi Muslims, um, other Catholics, um, uh, Episcopalian, uh, uh, an Indian shaman, uh, and there were Buddhist representatives and Hindu representatives. All, all of the major religions, including the indigenous, were represented for 20 years. So they had 20 annual meetings. And at the end of this 20 years of annual meetings, they, per, they published this book of notes called The Common Heart. And these were the major points of agreement of all of these different faiths. And this is actually the culmination of what the essence of mysticism is in the belief system. And, uh, and whether you're Catholic, whether you're Christian, it, the labels don't matter stuff anymore, right? The, the labels, mm -hmm. you can call yourself Buddhist one. or Christian. Yeah, they're all the same. So they, mm -hmm. they said ultimate reality can't be limited by any name or concept. Now, the, in other words, God, God uh, can't be in any one religion. Uh, one religion can't capture what he is. And it was interesting stuff. You mentioned that you were told that you could use any name when you went into an altered state, when you practiced whatever name or, or word, word you wanted to use. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter. Mm -mm. Uh, and, you know, consistently there's this emphasis that it doesn't matter at all. Uh, the second is spiritual authority comes from experience of this reality, which, by the way, has no definition. So how do you how do you know what ultimate reality is if there's no definition for it? So the, the, there's the oxymoron. You see the lack of consistency because there's no clear doctrine. It's just whatever you experience is true. Mm hmm. Uh, and that comes from within. So the emphasis here is on mysticism, the practice of altered states of consciousness. And the third bullet, the individual soul is none other than the divine. So this, again, is what we just unpacked from the original lie. Um, you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. Everything is non-dual. Uh, mm -hmm. Lastly, we give authority to holy scriptures based upon our confidence in their ability to help us, uh, to help others reach the greater authority, which they say is self-knowledge. And so right there you see that, okay, fine, we'll respect the Bible, but that's not the highest authority in the end. Mm -mm. It's personal experience, my experience. Right. That's the authority. So... I'm just uh, so thankful for the opportunity that we've had to, to go on this journey, Stephanie. What was it like for you to watch Mystified for the first time? Uh, it was sobering. Uh, though I had watched it in pieces and parts, there were many things I didn't remember when it came to watching the full film. I'm like, Oh, did he not show us that? <laughs> um, but I know that you did. It's just, it was, it was shocking and sobering. And like I said earlier, my heart just broke at some of these things. I, I was sitting there thinking at the same time, how could I have fallen for this? I didn't know. I, there, this is so convoluted 
not so much anymore because I've had time to unpack it. Um, but it takes time because it is so convoluted. And it's, uh, it, it, I, it almost, I don't want to say it left me hopeless. We have hope in God. He is hope. But when you put all of these journeys together in, some, in, in the different arenas, it seems like Satan has captured every arena. And how will people see through this? Yeah. You know, I was fearful for people who don't know what really this is. And even some people who may watch this and not understand it and, mm -hmm. and set it aside because they don't understand it. Um, I just, I just, I'm still really unpacking it, to be honest, Chris. Uh, it, there's so much here. Mm -hmm. And I praise God for what all he had you include. It was interesting and uh, really jaw-dropping to watch this process unfold over time because it grew from one thing to another and to another and another. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And each mm -hmm. piece just as important as the other. But then you start to see these common denominators. And so it's something that people are going to have to watch over <laughs> a few times, just as I am having to do that. And uh, I just, only God could have put this together. And I, I praise God that you, I mean, you lived this for years, Chris. You were, you immersed yourself in these writings and God protected you. I know people who have tried to study such things, and uh, there was a, a pull. They started to doubt uh, their beliefs in God. And so you were very protected in all of this. And uh, people have asked me, just on a personal note, how did it feel? How, how were you impacted when you heard the singing bowl, when you heard the chanting, when you heard that? My brain has been mapped. And so, yes, I was impacted. And every time I watch the film or hear these things, there is a pull to my mind and I immediately have to lay, you know, pull back. Mm -hmm. um, but God has protected me and I didn't experience a lot of that until we started working on the film. And, you know, but even God had prepared me for that. So uh, there's nothing, we may have to live some consequences of our decisions but there's nothing that God can't protect us from. And so uh, I praise God that wherever someone is who may be listening to this or watching this, uh, God d is not a respecter of persons. And I would encourage each and every person to dig deeper, uh, grasp this stuff with the help of the Holy Spirit and uh, come out of whatever you may be unknowingly participating in or believing that is in, in contrast to the Bible. We need, we need our minds and we need God's protection. Amen. For sure. What's really cool about the God of the Bible is that he has provided us with evidence that the Bible isn't just another book. And there's a reason why people are reading it less and less because you said it just a couple minutes ago, the devil has his hands now in virtually every major religion. And he has actually created uh, a giant stirring pot and it's called Babylon. And uh, again, there are, there are God-fearing people who are in various worldviews. God knows where you are. I don't know what, you're, you know what you believe, the people that are watching right now listening right now but I want to encourage you look at the evidence we show the evidence in the film we show the Dead Sea Scrolls we show the Daniel 9 prophecy uh, that shows that there was hundreds of years before Jesus Christ was born on the earth a very specific prophecy that is undeniably accurate and it could only have applied to one human being in world history and there are many other evidences that we're gonna show in future episodes about Jesus the Christ 
that he was the son of God. And um, I want to just uh, reflect on 2 Peter uh, chapter 1 that I've been memorizing this month, Stephanie. Uh, we have a scripture recitation group, and you, you said God has protected me during this last several years of working on this film, and I want to give God praise mm -hmm. because His Word is more powerful than any power in the earth, in any kind of enemy against the God of, of heaven. Um, the, the, the Bible is, is a powerful source for anyone who wants to know the true reality that we're living today. Not just about who mankind is, the nature of man, but why did we need a savior? Why, why is it that, that our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, which is what the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, verse 9. But what's really cool about 2 Peter chapter 1 that I wanted to mention uh, before we close that's so encouraging to me is one of the things these Roman Catholics love to say, especially Richard Rohr, is that the followers of Jesus never claimed uh, while, you know, around the early stages of the Christian church, that became a tradition of calling him the Christ later, but they didn't really ever believe that he was the Christ. And this is just not true. They're lying. They're, they're leading sheep to the slaughter because the evidence is very clear and consistent in the New Testament that the, the apostles, and here in 2 Peter chapter 1, he very clearly says, we were witnesses. We were with him on the mountain when the voice came from the cloud and the Father gave him glory and honor. And then the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And these were the very same words, Stephanie, that God the Father spoke when Jesus was anointed at his baptism, right? And yes. John the Baptist is quoted in Acts chapter 10. The apostle Peter quotes John the Baptist, who was a witness to the anointing by the father of his son. And then on the mountain, Peter said, we were witnesses. We had the prophetic word confirmed that this man is the Christ. And this was their testimony. This was the reason why they, the words they were preaching, it says in the book of Acts, they were blasphemed, which means they didn't believe Jesus was God. And the whole message of Paul and Peter throughout the book of Acts and all their letters is giving Jesus the glory as God and as Savior of mankind. And anyone who accepts him is going to have a promise right? A gift of mm -hmm. eternal life. And this can be anyone who's listening today, go study it out. Watch Mystified, see the evidence we present, and pray to the God of heaven, the God of the Bible as best you know how. And I promise you, he will be faithful to reveal himself to you. Mm -hmm. But the message of the New Testament is that Jesus is God. It's undeniable and unmistakable, and it's consistent. You just have to read it, right? And read yeah. it with, with, a, with, a, with a humble heart, and God will reveal to you the things that have just blessed me so much, stuff, and have strengthened my, my heart to believe even more now than before I started this film. Mm. That's beautiful. That's what studying does. When you study deep, I mean, the Bible, it proves itself. And then you bring in history and then that, that's another level of uh, proof. And so it's made your faith grow stronger. And then also As, you have the, you also have then the evidence in your own life mm -hmm. of even little things that you pray about that God answers your prayers through daily life right? This becomes another evidence that the same God who the apostles are praying to after Jesus goes back to heaven, the same God, the same Holy Spirit is promised to fill you and cleanse you from the inside out. That's the indwelling. That's the possession mm -hmm. that we're talking about, right? That yeah, anyone that's the good possession. <laughs> that's the good yeah. possession. 
Yes. That's we the have to surrender. Take it by faith. We we claim those promise, promises by faith. And we are promised the Holy Spirit. When we are baptized, we have a, a we have the Holy Spirit. We invite him into our lives every day and believe that he is with us. And this is this is what I believe we're seeing happening rapidly today, Stephanie, in our culture is everything is the labels are starting to be removed and we're starting to see the people who believe in the Bible that it is the literal word of God the solo scriptura right you mentioned this earlier this was the Protestant Reformation that is not finished yet mm -hmm. God is not done finishing what he started hundreds of years ago this yes. uh, this, so Revelation this, 14, 6 through 12 tells us that, right? That's and exactly so, right. Yes, and then Revelation 18, too. I think it's 18 where he says, come out of her, my people. Yes. So there are people still left in, in, in teachings that are not biblical that who will come out of those teachings and into. They will, they will continue that reformation in their own lives on an individual basis. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, a lot of people, well, not a lot, but some have actually asked, you know, what denomination is the producer of this film? You know, like they want to know if we're Seventh-day Adventists that produced this film because we're talking about the Seventh-day Sabbath in the film. We don't spend a lot of time talking about it. We spend a lot more time on presenting the truth about the nature of man and the state of the dead and the second coming of Jesus and who is Jesus and what is his nature? Right? What did the disciples teach about him? We'd spend a lot more time about that, but people have asked, what denomination are you? And, um, and I just think that's fascinating, right? Because we do have a unique message, but it is biblically based. It is mm -hmm. founded on the Bible. And they say, but don't you have a prophet? And that's going to be another video. We're going to do a whole separate <laughs> video on, on the present truth the prophetic mm -hmm. word of this time in history. But we don't have time for that today, but I just wanna, I wanna thank you, Stephanie, and I wanna ask if you would have a prayer before we close today. Oh, I'd love to, sure. Thank you, Chris. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you, God, for this time together. We thank you for your mighty works and um, your power from on high, Lord, that you, you work on our behalf to save us lord thank you for drawing us out of darkness and into your marvelous light thank you that what you start you finish and there are people and even us in our own lives uh, still work left to be done mm -hmm. we know that um we need the holy spirit we need your truth we need um to to walk more closely with you lord and so we thank you that uh, you do justify us lord and you also want to sanctify us so we will be prepared um, in that wedding garment uh, ready for your soon coming lord i ask that you continue to draw us out of darkness to open our eyes and minds and hearts to more of your truth lord maybe we, we be led um, by your word father you said you will guide us with your with thine eyes and so lord we have to be looking at you and how we look at you is by reading your word being in that word and not just paraphrases lord but the bible and so we just ask that you renew us revive us teach us lord convict us father and we thank you um, that you were more than willing to do that lord as you were um saving us lord and this i pray father and i thank you in the name of jesus your son amen 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 stephanie thank you for that now before we go i just want you to share with the viewers how can they find your programs how can they find your ministry and maybe talk a little bit about the materials they can they can find at your online site youtube stephanie griffin ministries on facebook stephanie griffin ministries and also instagram uh, Stephanie Griffin Ministries. We're also on Rumble, and I think that's uh, we had to change your name. Um, I forget, but it's S Griffin Ministries, I think there. But yeah. there's a link on the YouTube channel to it. So come on over, and let's do a deep dive into uh, aliens. Where do they? <laughs> what do they have in prophecy? You know, um, surprisingly, uh, the occult, um, Freemasonry, um, 
uh, witchcraft. We, we just unpack it all uh, and, of course, uplift truth, uh, the biblical truth and, and the God of the Bible. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for your mm -hmm. time today. I'm sure that we will see you again on this program sometime, hopefully soon. I look forward to it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all for joining me today on Hope on Fire. Uh, again, if you would like to watch this program, you can find us on hopeonfire.tv and see other episodes. You can also catch our full-length documentary feature films on our YouTube channel at My Life Streams. So God bless you all. We'll see you again next time. <laughs>